one. Um, um, so hi everyone, my name is Helen Fitzmorris. Um, I am a Sierra Club volunteer here in the Bay Area. I live in Oakland um, for a long time. So for five years, I taught uh, high school physics and chemistry at Pittsburgh High School um, up here in the Bay Area. And right now I am currently a graduate student at UC Berkeley. Um, so I just wanted to thank all of you for joining us uh, today at lunch to talk about climate change literacy. Um, you know, a recent study showed that about 90% of teachers and 80% of parents want climate change to be taught in schools. Um, but speaking from experience, not all teachers have the background knowledge, um, and I'm talking about myself, um, or tools to teach it effectively. Um, you know, that's not because they're not knowledgeable people, it's just not something that they received instruction in themselves. Um, so for the past couple of years, the Bay Area's uh, San Francisco Chapter Climate Literacy Committee has worked um, to help schools in our area uh, graduate all students climate literate. Um, and I wanted to sort of, before we get started, just take a moment and talk about um, what's going on in current events. And I'm, I'm stealing this, this is a direct quote from one of my colleagues in the Sierra Club um, Climate Literacy Committee, Scott DeYoung. Um, that he said when he was leading a different webinar recently. Um, so he said, you know, over the past few months, the coronavirus and the movement towards racial justice have dominated headlines, um, and the climate emergency is lurking in the background. And in fact, the climate literacy is exacerbating health inequality issues and promises to be the most important uh, event in the collective lives of our students. Um, so as we think about climate literacy today, um, I don't want us to think about how we're focusing on climate change instead of social justice, but I want us to think about how focusing on climate change is a part of social justice and how we can, um, you know, how important it is to make social justice a part of climate change literacy. Um, and, you know, I think that's something that we've really um, felt um, in the Bay Area Climate Literacy Committee um, so far, but I, I just want to sort of take that lens. Um, so to give you guys an, an idea of what we are doing today. So by the end of today, we want all of you to walk away with next steps for advancing climate literacy in your area. You know, you might be calling in not sort of sure if this is something you're going to take on, but just like pretending that you decide that you are, we want you to walk away with what am I doing next. Um, so we hope this will be sort of an interactive brainstorming experience for you. Um, you know, we started with our welcome, we're past that. Um, we're going to talk briefly, so about 15 minutes about the work we've done in Oakland Unified School District. I want to pause here and say that we've done um, work in some other school districts and in independent schools as well, but we wanted to sort of focus in on one example. Um, we'll take some questions and then the rest of the, um, you know, sort of half of this time we hope is dedicated um, to you sort of taking an inventory of what's going on in your area um, and sort of how could something like this either get started or if it's already going, um, what sort of things um, could you use to sort of make it go even more. Um, we're going to have uh, some small group discussions where we use sort of this inventory um, and sort of decide on what could be our next steps. Um, and then we'll close out and as a, as a group, Sarah and I will tell you what our next steps are and how we'll be um, providing with you with resources going forward. All right, so um, just, just to sort of give you an idea, I'm gonna be talking about Oakland Unified School District, but more than that, I wanna hit on a few points. So why is climate, what is climate literacy and why is it important? Um, sort of 
our group's approach, which has been to operate at the school district level as opposed to you know, the state level um, or the individual classroom level. Um, and then I'll walk you through sort of the experience we've been through in Oakland Unified School District. Um, so when I think about, I'm gonna make the assumption that everyone on this call knows about climate change and knows we need to do something um, pretty, pretty intense um, in our society to make changes um, around climate change. But why climate change literacy? Um, when, I, when I think about how we can affect the climate, I think about how we can affect the climate in two ways. One is by our individual, um, you know, reductions of our individual carbon footprint. And the other is by, um, you know, collective action as a society. Um, so, you know, just sort of thinking on the individual level, um, there was a professor at San Jose State University who recently did a study. And basically what he did is he tracked students over the course of 10 years and half of the students um, had taken one course in climate change and the other half had not. Um, and what he saw over, you know, 10 years, you know, into these students' adulthoods was that students who had taken one class on climate change had a reduced, a 20% reduction in their personal carbon footprint. Um, so, you know, if, if you're thinking about how do we change our society and how do we reduce the carbon that our society consumes and emits, 20% um, reduction for this thing being taught to everyone seems like a pretty good um, cost effective way um, to reduce our carbon emissions. You know, the second thing is that we, we know that 20% reductions isn't enough and we know that our society needs to change and, you know, it can't be up to individual people, but, you know, government needs to make an impact. And so, you know, I want an additional thing that climate change literacy um, has the potential to do for students if it's done well, um, is it teaches them how we can make that change within our society. Um, and it gives them tools for doing that. So, you know, hopefully, um, I'm sure you've all seen pictures like the right picture here in the news where students are coming out um, and, you know, demanding climate change um, policy. Um, but I also think that it gives, if you look at the left, um, the picture on the wall is of Oakland Unified School District. And, you know, it gives students an opportunity um, to learn how to make change and organize um, on a local level. And I'll talk more about this picture in a little bit, but I just think it's a really great picture and illustration of you know, the types of learning um, that students can do with climate change literacy. Okay, so I said climate change literacy is important, um, but what do we mean by climate change literacy? So the Sierra Club of California passed um, this resolution a few years ago where they defined climate change literacy and they said they wanted all high school students in California to graduate climate literate. So, you know, I, as a former science teacher, I, I know that, you know, when people say teaching climate change in schools, a lot of people are talking about their science. Um, they want science teachers to talk about the climate change um, the causes of climate change. Um, they want science teachers to talk about, you know, the changing of climate and what that means, um, you know, meteorologically and what that means for natural disasters. Um, but they're not usually talking about three through five here. So what is required to avoid climate de destabilization? You know, no, no matter how it's done, what do we need to do as you know, a global society to avoid climate destabilization? Um, what actions are needed to ensure a livable future? Um, and the key people and institutions involved in implementing those actions. And I, you know, it's been a while since I was in high school, but I, I know for sure I didn't learn about number five in school. Um, and so, you know, as we go throughout um, this 
webinar today, I really want you to think about three, four, and five um, and what that means um, to climate change literacy, um, what that means in terms of social justice, um, and how, how you could sort of push this um, as being taught in your communities. Okay, so how do we make this happen? We have these nice five um, points and the Sierra Club California declared, you know, we want this to happen. Um, so, so how do we get to the point where all students graduate climate literate? Um, our group, the Climate Literacy Committee um, in the Bay Area came together in late 2016, early 2017. Um, and we decided that, you know, the place where we could really make change was at the local level at the school district level. And so we quickly decided that our strategy was this, we needed to get buy-in from the communities, you know, the school districts, so that students, teachers, administrators, and politicians in the district. And, you know, I, I would add parents, but each of these constituents is really important to making this work. Um, with that buy-in pass resolutions at the school district, um, or independent school, we've worked with some independent schools as well, um, and then support implementation, and then keep pushing on that support and make sure that the structures that are put in place um, are going to reach all students. Um, and that the learning that's going on is action oriented and not just, um, you know, we're putting CO2 in the air. CO2 absorbs infrared radiation. All right, so how did this sort of go and where are we now? So, you know, I told you that in winter 2016, we established this committee. Um, we really chose to work with OUSD um, because of who showed up in the room. So, you know, I live in Oakland and um, many of our members live in Oakland, but Really importantly, a few teachers from Oakland Unified School District showed up to our meeting and that sort of helped us get the ball rolling there. Um, so as we said, we drafted uh, a resolution for the school boards and adapted it specifically for Oakland. Um, and then, you know, this really took like a year um, from fall 2017 to spring 2018, um, we got constituents, you know, people who are part of Oakland Unified School District to advocate um, for passing this resolution. So we got, um, you know, we we're really fortunate to have an AP environmental science teacher who invited us to his classroom to talk about the resolution. Um, and his students chose to make um, the resolution sort of their year long project and they, you know, emailed school but board members, they circulated petitions and they came to school board meetings to speak about it. Um, and, you know, that was really impactful. The other great partner we had in um, making this resolution, you know, come to fruition was the Environmental Justice Caucus of the Teachers Union in Oakland. Um, and so they also committed to making the passage a priority. Um, and you know, like the students, they came to school board meetings. Um, you know, they helped us meet with school board members who weren't necessarily on board with passing the resolution. Um, and, you know, they were really a strong partner. Um, so in June 2018, we got this board policy passed. And I think really importantly, as a result of this board policy, um, the school district formed the ECL, which stands for Environmental and Climate Change Literacy Working Group. Um, and so this working group is composed of, you know, um, sort of all sorts of people within Oakland Unified School District. So we have, you know, administrators who are in charge of curriculum who are part of this working group. We have um, teachers, we have people who are in charge of facilities, um, the person who is in charge of nutrition services. So this sort of broad spectrum of people who are part of the school district working to make climate change literacy 
um, a reality in the district. Um, so, you know, the preliminary policy passed, um, the updated policy passed, and then this past year in 2019-2020, we've really been getting things off the ground. So um, we've had a number of teacher workshops. We um, wrote a few grants to get teachers paid um, to do um, professional development and to develop curriculum um, for OUSD that's really rooted in Oakland. And if you're somebody who has tried to teach climate change, um, you probably know there's a lot of resources out there and not very many that are tailored to the needs of all students. And so, you know, paying teachers to develop Oakland specific curriculum is, I think, really important. Um, I want to take a second before I move on um, to sort of highlight sort of, you know, my little figure on the right, you know, we weren't the first people in Oakland Unified School District who are interested in climate change literacy. And there were a lot of people kind of doing their own thing in their own classroom um, who, who wanted to make this a bigger thing. But I think what we did with our resolution is sort of bring them all together and have them focus together. And so there, I think we were leading. Um, but ultimately, you know, we transitioned to supporting the groups that form. So, you know, both the ECHO Working Group and the Environmental Justice Caucus of the Union are right now doing a lot. Um, and we are playing a supporting role. And that's the way it should be because they know their district and they know their students and they know um, what they need. And it's not for us to tell them what they need. Um, really quickly, I wanted to highlight some things, some of the language we got in a board policy. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I myself get frustrated with the passing of resolutions because, you know, there's all this verbiage and no action. Um, but I, I think when you pass a resolution or a board policy that has useful language in it, um, you can use it as a tool to get what you want. Um, so in this policy, the superintendent has to um, designate someone to uh, research, review, and recommend curriculum for adoption. Um, they have to, you know, articulate both science and history curricula. So, you know, thinking about what climate literacy means, it doesn't just mean that we know CO2 is raising temperatures um, in, on the across the world. We need to think about, you know, what does climate change mean socially? Um, you know, it called for integrated action-based projects, um, providing professional development to teachers, um, and pursuing and developing the financial resources necessary to make this happen. So, you know, it didn't allocate funding, um, but what this policy really led to was the formation of this working group within um, the Oakland Unified School District and they are doing all these things. So they're looking at curriculum, um, they're providing professional development, they're supporting action-based projects, um, and they are pursuing, you know, hundreds of thousand dollar um, grants to continue to support this project. Um, so, you know, this is something that this group is sort of looking not just at what professional development can we do um, this semester, but how can we develop this as a program um, going forward over the next five years? Um, just to kind of highlight what's happening, um, I think it's really important that we have these two distinct groups. So within Oakland Unified School District, we have the district group, the Environmental and Climate Change, Change Literacy Working Group, um, and so they've put on a number of Saturday workshops with professional development. They're able as a school district to apply for larger grants and support teachers across the district. Um, and on the other side, and I think doing, you know, just as important, the Environmental Justice Caucus of the Teachers Union. Um, so they supported a um, professional development 
um, pairs advancing climate teaching where teachers were paired up and developed Oakland specific curricula and were paid for it. And as a union, they're also able to get more political um, than the district might feel comfortable doing. Um, I said I would come back to this picture at the end. Um, and I think that it, it's like one of my favorite pictures in the whole world. So um, there was a, again, AP environmental science class who decided that, you know, they wanted to help us with what we were doing. And as their class project, um, one of the things that they were doing was recruiting teachers to come to these professional development opportunities. And, you know, we told them, you know, we don't want to just see teachers from, you know, the rich schools within Oakland. We want to see, you know, a geographically equitable representation of teachers so that this is reaching, you know, maybe not every student, but a geographically representative, <coughs> excuse me, geographically, um, you know, racially, socioeconomically representative slice of the students in our district. Um, and so how they did this is they printed out this map of the district um, and they sort of brainstormed, they cut out these Family Guy um, cartoon characters of themselves. Um, and they, they brainstormed which of us knows people in which um, locations. And so they made sure they were geographically representative of the district and they each took on assignments for where they were going to recruit participants from. Um, and, you know, I think that's like such, I wish I had learned how to do that in high school. Um, and I think the environmental movement as a whole is struggling with the fact that, you know, it's, uh, I'll, I'll say this for myself and not the Sierra Club, but you know, it, it has traditionally been thought of as a white person's um, and a socially economically advantaged person's um, pursuit to uh, do environmentalism. And I think it's really important that um, that not go on. Um, and I think sort of teaching at the high school level that that's not okay and giving uh, people tools to try to begin to address that is just a really neat thing to do. Um, so general lessons, I think that we found as we were going through, um, again, reaching everyone in your district is going to be tricky, um, but you need to keep trying. Um, it's really important that as many people as possible um, are reached by this. And Oakland Unified School District is certainly not all the way there, um, but we're moving in that direction. Um, number two, um, you know, it, it's really important that the groups within a district take ownership of this process. Um, you might, as someone outside of the district, or even as, you know, a teacher within the district, be able to get the ball rolling, um, but it really belongs to, you know, the district as a whole, and I mean everyone in the district, I mean teachers, students, administrators, um, parents, etc. cetera. Um, it can't be the science teacher's burden alone. Um, three, there are a lot of environmentally oriented curriculum providers in the Bay Area and elsewhere. Um, you know, you don't have to build everything from the ground up. It's really important to make connections. Um, and I think more people than you expect will come out of the woodwork. Um, and then for implementation is not easy and teachers are already overworked. Um, you need to pay them to take this on um, and for them to develop something that's really quality. And I think it's really important that this happens, but it's also really important to recognize that it's a lot of work. All right, so thank you so much for listening. And um, we're gonna take questions. The way that's gonna happen is uh, Sarah is going to read questions that come to the chat. I will. Nothing's come up so far, but 
we'll give people a minute to type in. And I will be sending a copy of this deck in just a moment as well, um, so that you all have it to reference. Um, one question, do we have any contact with um, San Francisco USD yet? Um, and that's from, sorry, we just got a bunch of questions. It's wonderful. That was from Ellen. Um, Ellen, we have some. We'd love to connect with you afterwards and think about how we might coordinate um, because we haven't, we're not as far along with San Francisco as we are with other districts. But we also had several people uh, from San Francisco Unified School District who are sort of eager to get up and going attend our webinar last week. So, yep, we'll be able to connect you all. Um, the next question, can you explain a little more about how you, you used the map with the family guy pictures? <laughs> okay, so I didn't do this. Um, this was basically, so there's a AP environmental science uh, classroom and one of their projects is to sort of be, um, be they, they pick a, um, a project to work on. And so, and th there's a client to that project. So in that case, the Sierra Club um, was, or I think it was the Environmental Justice Caucus of the Teachers Union was the client. And um, part of their, you know, job was to recruit people to um, a Saturday professional development workshop, much like you're seeing in these pictures. Um, and, you know, in our first sort of go round, we really only got teachers from certain schools, you know, the schools where we knew people. Um, and so what, what the, and so we said, you know, we didn't say you have to print out a map, but we said, you know, we need a more equitable representation of the district. And so uh, what they chose to do was sort of, you know, think of who had, you know, either gone to elementary school um, in somewhere across the district or had a cousin who went to an elementary school in a different place. Um, and they each assigned themselves places to contact. So, I, you know, it, it was, I just thought it was a really neat way to sort of represent what they were doing. Thanks, Helen. Um, there was a question, do we have a group on LinkedIn? Um, we don't, but we could. I think that, that could be a really, a really good suggestion. So let us get back to you on that. Um, there was a question I received, do we focus on high school or all grade levels? Um, the original intent of the Sierra Club um, resolution was to focus on high schools to ensure that high school students are graduating climate literate. However, as we've done this work, we've recognized that um, students um, as early as kindergarten are hearing about the, the idea of climate change and that there is a um, age appropriate way to have that curriculum starting in elementary school. And of course it becomes um, more uh, advanced as, as we go up. So we are open to all ages with a special focus on high school. And I think there's a lot of teacher interest um, in elementary and middle school too. Yeah, we and we didn't, you know, I think that was a way where we had thought one thing and then the people we were working with were like, no, we need this other thing. Yeah. Yep. Can, um, I, can I make a comment? Yeah. Um, and I, uh, an area that I work in, I, I'm a, a infectious disease physician and I work with vaccines. I've done a lot of study of anti-vaccine people, and I realize that you have to, if you want to educate, you have to start way before, you have to start in grade school. Yeah. And I think that's, I would suggest that things should be really down in grade school and, uh, and reaching and even preschool with things like Sesame Street. Uh, yeah. to get, uh, because it's too late when people of mine are made up. Yep. And that's the, unfortunately the situation in yeah. high school. Yeah, I th and I think that's, that's consistent with what we've heard from teachers. Thank you, James. Um, we can take, I think we have time for one more. We have a lot of questions and we'll make sure to grab these and we'll answer them in our follow-up email because we won't be able to get to all of them. Um, but there was a question about connections with the California EEI curriculum and developers. Um, and we have, that's the 
um, what's it called? Energy, I always forget. Innovation. Anyway, we we have um, we do have connections with them, and they do provide really good curriculum, primarily at that high school level. Um, so that's on our list of resources. Um, I think we should stop there because we are we're, we're heading into our next section. Helen, do you want to tee it up? And as you talk about it, I will put two links in the chat box. One is a link to this presentation that we've just looked at, and the second link is. Um, uh, this assessment that we're going to ask you to spend the next few minutes thinking about. All right, so um, now that we've kind of shared um, what we've done with you, we want to give you a chance to think through, you know, what's going on where you are. And so what we did is based on what we've learned in the past few years and some of the things that we wish we knew as we were starting out um, that we didn't know we needed to know. Um, we wrote this inventory. So it's basically a bunch of questions um, that will prompt you to start thinking about these things. So Sarah's gonna pop this into the chat. We're gonna give you 10 minutes to fill it out. Um, and then we really want you to click submit. So we will share the results um, with the rest of this group, you'll be able to see other people's answers. Um, and we're doing this because a lot of times I find that I don't always have the best ideas. Um, and I, I think it's always really exciting to see what other people are thinking. And there might even be people in this group who, you know, live in your area, in your school district or a neighboring school district, um, who really have some information but that might be useful to you. Um, before we sort of say go for it, I do want to stress um, we really appreciate um, that you put your name in the survey, um, but because we are sharing it with the rest of the participants, um, the email segment is optional. So if you're okay with somebody from this group reaching out to you and saying, hey, you know, I live in your school district or a neighboring school district, um, I saw that you filled this out. Would you want to um, follow up? Please put your email in. And if you don't want that, um, don't put your email in. All right. So with that, we're going to have 10 minutes of awkward silence. Um, and we're going to ask you to fill out this inventory. If you're having technical trouble, um, you can sort of put your troubles into the chat and we'll help you troubleshoot. Um, but we're just gonna give you 10 minutes to fill this out. And it should look something like this.
<laughs> right. Um, I have a question. Am I screen sharing or do I need to redo that since I came back from my breakout room? Uh, you can redo it, I think. All right. There You're you doing go. it. Okay. All right. So thank you all for joining us um, today. I know that you know, having only 10 minutes to talk about this is a really short time, but we want to sort of acknowledge that some people have to be done with lunch and get back to their work exactly at 1 p.m. So we're gonna try to end as close to time as possible. Um, we wanted to really quickly share with you what our next steps are. Um, and we hope you continue working on this with us. Um, so, Shortly, you should receive a follow-up interest, uh, follow-up email from us. So we'll be sending out um, a list of curricular resources that we have um, accumulated. Um, we will also be asking if it's okay to connect you via email to attendees, either from today's um, webinar or from last week's webinar who are in your geographic area. Um, and then we'll also be following up with your group to see how we can support you in getting started. Um, we'd also just love to hear from you about what you are doing because I'm sure some of you have tried great things um, and have great things going on that you know we don't here in the Bay Area. So that's what's sort of coming up. Um, we really hope um, to hear from all of you and we'd love to support you in this work going forward. Um, so that is, that is pretty much it for today. Are there any questions before we break in 30 seconds? <laughs> I had one, one quick update. So the, the link I sent out with responses, I do believe that had the responses, if you need to scroll down a little bit, there's a lot of um, names at the beginning, but then if you scroll down, you'll see those responses. And then the second thing is just um, a bit of an invitation. Um, if you've joined this meet, some, for whatever reason you joined this meeting, we're so glad you came. We're so glad you spent your lunch hour with us. And if you're right now feeling like um, you don't have connections to schools and that that makes you less than, do not feel that way. Um, I myself, when I started this work, I didn't have any school-age children. Um, I do now, they've gotten older, but, um, but I am just somebody who really had a desire to do something good um, and, and sort of move what my, my professional experience into more of an activism setting. And it has been hugely gratifying. So part of what we're trying to do is really inspire people to um, get connected in together and then use your resources and your knowledge and your interests to um, help make sure that our, that our youth are prepared for what's to come. Um, so we hope that you leave this feeling inspired and, and looking forward to next steps. And we, we look forward to hearing what you do with it. Cool. Okay, thank you all. And if you're not able to see those, I'm seeing some people say they're not able to see the responses. We'll get those over to you in the follow-up as well then. Excellent. Thank you all. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.